Welcome to the Deep Dive. Today we're looking at uh, something really quite perplexing in the semiconductor world. Applied Materials, you know, AMAT, a giant in ship manufacturing uh, equipment, NIFRO. They just dropped their latest earnings report and the results for Q3, stellar. Easily beat expectations, but then boom, their stock tumbled almost 11% down in after hours trading. How does that happen? Record performance, but the stock falls off a cliff. We're gonna unpack the immediate earnings numbers and crucially that forward guidance to see what's really going on behind the headlines. So yeah, let's dive right into that market reaction first. It was pretty stark. On August 14th, 2025, during the regular trading day, AMAT stock slipped just uh, just under 1%, closed at $188.24. But the moment that earnings report came out after the bell, wow. It just plummeted, nearly 11% down in after hours, settling around $168.25. It's a real market head scratcher, isn't it? When good news apparently isn't good enough. And the thing is, the fiscal third quarter results of ones ending July 27th, they were genuinely strong, really strong. Applied Materials reported revenue of $7.3 billion. That easily beat the fact set expectation, which was uh, $7.22 billion. And you know, fact sets estimates are what Wall Street watches closely. So not just a beat, but solid growth too, up 8% year over year from $6.78 billion. And then there's the adjusted EPS. Earnings per share came in at $2.48 per share. That was significantly higher than fact sets expected, $2.36. Now this adjusted EPS is sometimes called non-GAAP EPS. It often gives you a clearer view of like the core operational profit, stripping out some one-off things. And that $2.48, that's a hefty 17% increase from the $2.12 they did a year ago. They even call these figures record numbers for the quarter. So on the surface, it looks amazing, right? But clearly the market slammed the brakes hard. What was the real story? That forward guidance must be it. You absolutely hit it. That's exactly where the story turns. What happened, and this is so often the case with these market reactions, it really comes down to the future, not just the past quarter. While Applied Materials Q3 was no doubt strong, the thing that really spooked the market was the forward guidance. Specifically, their forecast for the fiscal fourth quarter. They forecast adjusted earnings per share around $2.11 and revenue around $6.7 billion. Now, those are the midpoints of their guidance range. Okay, now compare that to what Wall Street analysts were modeling for Q4. The street expected earnings of $2.39 per share on sales of $7.33 billion. So you see, Applied's actual forecast was noticeably lower on both earnings and revenue, lower than the market was banking on. And just to add context, this Q4 forecast is also lower than what they actually did in Q4 last year. Back then, it was 2.32 cents in EPS and $7.05 billion in sales. So it's this gap, this difference between their outlook and the market's expectation that really triggered that big negative reaction. The market is always looking ahead, sometimes very critically. Right, that classic paradox. Great quarter, but a cautious look ahead just tanks the perception. So what reasons did the company leadership actually give for this sudden caution? Why put out what seems like a, well, a weak outlook? Yeah, they were pretty direct about it. CEO Gary Dickerson, he pointed to what he termed a dynamic macroeconomic and policy environment. He basically said this environment is creating, and I quote, increased uncertainty and lower visibility in the near term, including for our China business. That's a pretty significant flag, right? It signals they're feeling the effects of bigger geopolitical and economic shifts. It's not just about the tech cycle anymore. Global factors are really playing a role. And the CFO Bryce Hill, he added more detail. He said the expected Q4 revenue decline is, quote, driven by both digestion of capacity in China and nonlinear demand from leading edge customers given market concentration and fab timing. EK, let's pause on digestion of capacity. What does that mean for you, uh, the listener? It essentially means customers, especially in China, are busy using the equipment they already have installed. They're sort of working through that existing capacity before they place big orders for new machines. It doesn't necessarily mean long-term demand is gone, but it points to a temporary slowdown in new equipment buys as fabs get fully utilized. It shows how these global trade patterns and local spending can create these uh, pauses and non-linear demand. That just means customer orders aren't coming in a steady stream. They're more lumpy, fits and starts, makes forecasting harder. Hmm. That digestion of capacity in China really brings it home. You can see how these big global trends actually hit the ground running, affecting specific business segments. So how does that caution translate into their actual forecasts for the different parts of their business in Q4? Are some areas feeling it more than others? What does that breakdown tell us? Well, looking at the numbers, their biggest segment, semiconductor systems, that's expected to bring in about $4.7 billion in Q4. That's definitely down from the $5.427 billion they just did in Q3. So a noticeable dip there. But on the other hand, their services business, Applied Global Services or AGS, that's expected to be pretty stable. They're forecasting around $1.60 billion, basically flat with Q3's $1.600 billion. 
And interestingly, the display segment, that's actually projected to go up around $350 million compared to $263 million in Q3. And overall, they're aiming for a non-JAP gross margin around 48.1% for Q4. Still pretty healthy, operationally speaking. Yeah, it's really fascinating, isn't it? How fast market sentiment pivots. Mm -hmm. You go from celebrating a record quarter to moments later, reacting really strongly to future projections, especially when those projections hint at a slowdown in a place as important as China for them. It just underlines that the market is always trying to look around the corner. And sometimes that forward look can totally overshadow mm -hmm. really excellent current results. The market's grading your next quarter, not just your last one. And right now, the signal it sees is a bit of a temporary slowdown in some equipment spending areas. That forward-looking nature is crystal clear here. It's almost brutal, like you said. Yeah. But for a company like Applied Materials, how do they manage that? Balancing the short-term market reaction with you know, their much longer game plan. Because despite this Q4 caution, the CEO, Gary Dickerson, sounded incredibly confident about the long term. What's driving that confidence? What are they really focused on beyond just the next three months? That's the crucial counterpoint, isn't it? Dickerson really emphasized that despite these uh, immediate headwinds, the company is still, quote, on track to deliver our sixth consecutive year of revenue growth in fiscal 2025. And he doubled down, saying they remain very confident in the longer-term growth opportunities for the semiconductor industry and applied materials. He tied that confidence directly to the global race for AI leadership. I mean, basically positioning uh, applied materials as a company, providing the fundamental tools needed to win that race. So the insight is, while the market's reacting to the next 90 days, Applied is playing a much longer game based on what they see as massive structural demand shifts driven by things like AI. Mm. And that AI connection is absolutely key to understanding their strategy. Applied materials isn't just selling machines. They see themselves positioned right at the heart of what they call major device inflections. Think of these as critical turning points where chip technology fundamentally changes, requiring completely new ways to manufacture them. And these changes are essential for AI's progress. For example, for the most advanced logic chips, the brains behind AI applied is a major player in enabling things like gate all around transistors, GAA. That's the next big leap after FinFET, offering better performance as chips get smaller. And also backside power delivery, a totally new way to get power into the chip more efficiently. A fab, a factory built with these new technologies. It actually increases Applied's potential revenue opportunity by about 30% compared to the previous generation fabs. Then you've got high performance memory, DRAM, crucial for feeding data to those powerful AI processors. Applied says they're best positioned for the next big shifts here, like 3D DRAM and high bandwidth memory HBM, where you stack memory chips vertically for incredible speed. Getting data move faster is vital for AI. And don't forget advanced packaging. This is becoming huge. It's about how you connect different types of chips together efficiently in one package, maybe a logic chip with HBM. It breaks old limits. They expect more than double their packaging business to over $3 billion in the next few years. And they say their market share there is well above the company's overall equipment share. Their material science expertise is key here. And finally, power electronics. Think silicon carbide, seco or gallium nitride, J-E-N. These materials are much better than silicon in handling high power, which is essential for electric vehicles, but also for the massive data centers powering AI. Just the data center power chip market could hit $9 billion by 2030. Across all of this, their edge comes from materials engineering leadership deposition, etch, implant basically, manipulating materials at the atomic level to build these incredibly complex structures. It's deep science. Wow, that's a really powerful set of long-term technology shifts they're banking on. It paints a very different picture from just the Q4 dip. And it's not just abstract tech bets, right? They're putting serious money down on physical infrastructure too, especially in the US. Like that $200 million investment in Arizona for a new components facility, that adds to over $400 million they've already put into U.S. infrastructure in the last five years. And they make a point of saying they're the largest U.S. maker of semiconductor equipment. That definitely signals a long-term commitment, well beyond just chasing the next quarter's numbers. That's exactly right. And look at their capital allocation, how they use their money. It reinforces that long-term view. Over the last 10 fiscal years, they've poured over $22 billion into R&D, research and development plus another $6 billion in capital additions like new facilities. That's a huge reinvestment back into the business, into innovation. And beyond that, they're also focused on returning cash to shareholders. They aim to distribute 80 to 100% of their free cash flow over time. They do that through dividends, which have grown at about a 15% compound annual rate over the last decade, which is impressive. And also through share buybacks, they've actually reduced their total number of shares outstanding by a third 
over the past 10 years, and they still have nearly $15 billion left on their current buyback authorization. So connecting all these dots, the R&D spend, the infrastructure investment, the shareholder returns, it strongly suggests they're not pulling back because of near-term uncertainty. If anything, they seem to be doubling down on their long-term strategy, believing these current headwinds are temporary. That tells you a lot about their internal confidence. So we've really explored this tension today, haven't we? This clash between the immediate market shock over the Q4 outlook and Applied Materials' own deep conviction in its long-term game plan. How do those two things really interact in a company like this day to day? It's that constant push and pull. The market reacting instantly while the company tries to emphasize its fundamental strengths. And those strengths are real. I mean, Q3 was a record quarter. Growth across all three segments, semi-systems, AGS, and display. And they kept their non-GAAP gross and operating margins strong, showing they're running the current business profitably. And that applied global services segment, ABS, is a really important anchor for them. It hit record core services revenue. And get this, it's seen 24 straight quarters of year-over-year -year revenue growth at six years. Plus, over two-thirds of that core services revenue comes from subscriptions. That creates a really stable, predictable income stream. That kind of recurring revenue helps cushion them when the equipment sales cycle dips. It adds resilience. Oh, and the display segment's profitability jump in Q3 operating margin went from 6.4% last year to 23.6% driven by OLED investments. That also shows strength beyond just the main semiconductor equipment business. Their CFO, Brace Hill, specifically mentioned they're navigating and adapting using their robust supply chain, global manufacturing footprint, and deep customer relationships. That points to their operational ability to manage through these choppy waters. And it raises a really interesting question for you, the listener, to think about. What does this specific situation with applied materials tell us about how sensitive the whole semiconductor industry is to global trade, to economic policy, even when the underlying demand for the technology itself like for AI, it seems incredibly strong, shows just how interconnected everything is. It's been a really fascinating look under the hood today. Thanks for walking us through that. We saw Applied Materials deliver this really exceptional Q3 performance, only to have it immediately overshadowed by a much more cautious Q4 outlook. And that caution seems tied mainly to factors like that digestion of capacity in China and this less predictable or non-linear customer demand pattern. Exactly. But... And this is the key takeaway, perhaps. Despite those near-term issues, the company leadership seems absolutely unwavering in their long-term belief. They're focused on these huge technology shifts, AI, advanced packaging, new materials, and their core strengths in materials engineering. It's definitely a reminder that a single quarter's guidance or the market's immediate reaction to it doesn't always capture the full long-term picture. So as you think about all this, here's a final thought for you to consider. When you're trying to gauge a company's true long-term prospects, what carries more weight? Is it the snapshot of a single quarter's earnings guidance? Or is it the bigger picture, the strategic bets, the technological waves they're riding, the foundational investments they're making? Something to ponder until our next deep dive.